Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on removing the roadblocks to your food safety training program. My name is Holly Cardozo. I'm a member of the marketing team with SA Global Assurance in the Americas region, and I'm pleased to welcome you today. Before we dive in, I'll just speak to a few housekeeping slides um, so that you know how to interact with us during the webinar. Firstly, we will be recording the webinar, and we will share a link to both the recording as well as the slide deck within two business days. So we'll receive that post-webinar. You're automatically muted upon entry to the webinar. This is part of the software. You're welcome to interact with us in one of two ways. One is through the Q&A session at the end. You can use the Q&A button. It's in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Click on the three small arrows and enter your question, and I encourage you to do so as you think of them. We'll have some time to review, and we'll speak to as many of those questions at the end of the webinar. You may collapse that Q&A box off to the right of the screen so you have full screen view by clicking on those three small arrows once again. The other way that you can interact with us during the webinar is through our quick poll question. We only have one today. Uh, we'll capture your response, and we'll share um, the poll results so you can see how you sit amongst your peers. So with that, I'll introduce you to our presenter today, Dr. Bob Strong. Dr. Bob is one of our um, senior consultants. He's an industry leader. He's a trainer. He does um, a whole suite of things for us. He's a wealth of information that spent a lot of time helping organizations drive their food safety operations um, across a number of different standards and is a wealth of information. So I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Bob today. And with that, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, Ali, and uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll keep warm for those of you who are in the climate areas where it's going to be very cold for the next couple of days. So good morning, good afternoon, whatever you are. What are we going to try and talk about today is the roadblocks to training, things that are causing you to have issues, maybe getting to training, getting to be able to do training, getting costs to do training. In other words, we try to relate to what you're finding are your challenges. So I'm going to try to give you some advice and guidance on this, on how you maybe can face these challenges and somewhat deflect them or minimize them. So we're going to talk about affording the time and successfully allocating costs because training does have costs attached to it. But the costs are very little compared with what would happen if you didn't do training. We're also going to talk about staff turnover, for which for some of you may be minimal, but for some industries, it is a tremendous amount of turnover in certain industries, and yet they're still challenged with having to train the employees. Then how do you balance the production has to stop for you to do training? And you're taking the employees away from the line, which has a negative effect on product going out the door, but it has to have a positive effect in the fact that you have to train your employees. What do you do when the law says you have to do the training? And obviously training is designed not only to make sure employees know what they're doing, but to practice continuous improvement. So hopefully you'll get some little snippets out of this. You'll get some things out of that you hadn't thought about. Maybe it just it basically re-enhances what you've been thinking yourself. So I'm gonna ask Holly to just do a poll to start with to get a feel for what you feel is your biggest challenges. Great, thanks Dr. Bob. So I'll let me launch the poll here. I'll give you about 30 seconds and I'll read through the responses. So perhaps your greatest roadblock is um, acquiring management approval. So the time and the cost that you need to allocate to um, partake in the training. Perhaps it's dealing with staff turnover, um, balancing production quotas and employee time, adherence to rules and regulations, or ensuring the continuity within the program. So I'll leave it about 20 seconds here and let you select the one response that's most suited to your organization. And we've almost got everyone, Dr. Bob, actually. We've got a quick audience today. So what would you expect would be the, the greatest challenge that folks would say? I would think sometimes getting management to approve them to go to training personally themselves, not necessarily a challenge, uh, getting management approval to train the employees inside their facility, but having to leave their facility and spend money to go somewhere to get training that they in individually have to get. Mm, indeed. All right, let me close and share the results. Thanks everyone for your responses. So the top two were actually dealing with staff turnover and balancing production quotas and employee time, but really quite an even spread across all of these challenges. 
All right. Well, that's good. That means that obviously you know, one of your biggest challenges is not they're trying to get management to give you the money to go to training when you have to go away from your facility. So let's talk about affording that time and successfully allocating the costs. You know, obviously it's very easy, uh, it's easier to get approval for training when the law says you have to do it. So let's just go over a couple of things where you legally you have to have somebody at your facility who's trained seafood hassle, juice hassle, low acid canning. For the USDA, meat and poultry hassle. Preventive controls for human foods, PCQI, you actually don't have to go to that training. It is just strongly recommended because remember one of your other options is you can have years of experience and therefore qualify to be a PCQI. I would say in most cases, I would recommend you go get the training. FDA also recommends it for food defense, which if you remember comes up in the middle of this year and you gotta have this food defense plan. And sometimes it's a question of what has to go in the food defense plan, how do I put it together? You have to go to training. No, you can do it by other means. But again, you just got out that food defense plan. But the FDA does require it for drivers now who are, are driving trucks that are carrying produce. And basically, it says you have to have the drivers trained at least in personal health and hygiene. And we'll talk about how you can do that in a minute. And GFSI schemes, as you noticed, if you have got one of those GFSI schemes, there are several places where they require training and proof of training to show the GFSI auditor. So why is training essential? Well, because by law, you have to have it. By law, you've got to have some records to be able to show the FDA now, if you're an FDA plan, and you have to be able to show the GFSI auditor that the people have had the training. And then also you have to be able to demonstrate that they are competent. And competent means that they understand what they're doing and they understand what to do when things go wrong. And now they're gonna be questioned, not by just the GFSI auditor, but now they're gonna be questioned by the FDA investigator when he comes in your plans and you can't be answering the questions for them. So if you haven't trained them real well, they may very well give answers that you would rather they hadn't. But if they're well trained, a part of the training would be to practice with them how to answer questions. The minimum the FDA has says you have to give everybody working in a food place is a minimum of personal hygiene and health and why that's important and why their own personal hygiene and health could finish up contaminating the product. I would say for most of your employees, you're gonna give them much more than that, but that's the minimum you have to do. So now you have to talk about allocating time because now if I've got to pull employees off the line to do the training, how am I gonna do this training? Do I have people in my facility who can do this training? And how often do I have to do this training? So who are you training? You're training management personnel or you're training all the employees? How long is the training gonna take? We're gonna talk about that. How are you going to do that training? If it's you, you may have to go off site to do that, or you may have to bring somebody in to do that, and you have to balance that costs and which is the most efficient way. We'll talk about the advantages of bringing somebody in versus you going yourself out where you would be the only one trained. Well, then training impact your operations. Well, the question is if you're the GFSI person on site and you don't have a backup, then when you leave the site, then who covers for you? So that's something that has to be uh, thought about, but yet you have to go get the training. You have to have a certificate. You have to be able to prove it. So I think it's a little easier when you're trying to convince the most senior person in your facility that you have to get training when it is mandatory either by the regulators or it's mandatory for a GFSI team. But you still gotta balance your schedule so that you do it when it's a more convenient time. But that brings challenges because if you're going to leave your site, is there a class available for you to go to and in a time frame that's convenient for you. And then when you talk about your Ali employees, we'll talk about that when you're gonna close down production to pull them off the line. And yet you need to do it and you need to have records to be able to show it. So when you're doing this training, you wanna make sure it's effective. 
Because if you're just going to talk, the employees are going to listen, or you think they're listening, and they're really not listening. And then when they go back to the job, they didn't benefit from the training. Then why was the pro- what was the problem there? Was it because the environment you had them doing the training in wasn't comfortable? They couldn't hear properly. There was many distractions. You kept going too long. And they say for hourly employees, about 30 to 45 minutes is about the time you want to have an hourly employee sitting listening to you while you're training them. After that, I think you lose their attention. You may give them information overload. They may be anxious to get back to whatever they were doing before. You may want to offer a question to answer, again, like we're going to do here, where we're asking you now to type in any questions you have, and I will make an attempt at the end to answer as many of them as possible. But if you're sitting in a meeting room trying to train people and the PA system's going off and people are listening to that instead of you, or you haven't told them to mute their cell phones or told them they can't bring their cell phones, then unfortunately one of the distractions that you see these days is people get on their cell phones and they start looking at their text messages. Well, they can't do that if you don't have the cell phones in the room. Again, you gotta be careful on how you do the, the training that it's in the appropriate language, meaning that if you're gonna to talk to people who are more familiar with maybe Spanish or French Canadian or something, then it'd be much better if you're doing the training in the appropriate language. Therefore, your trainers have to know what they're training people in. So if you just hand it off to anybody in your facility and say, go train these employees, and the person who's doing the training doesn't really understand the job or the, or the training materials, then I'm not sure you're getting the message across real well. So one of your challenges is obviously, what, do I have people who are knowledgeable enough to train other employees? Can they explain? Can they answer questions? And that's why sometimes I say it's always better to go to a training session where you've got a live instructor who can answer questions for you because sometimes you learn more from the questions and answers, even if you didn't ask the question, than you do by just listening to somebody talk and show you slides. But when you do this training, one of the things that happens is not all of your employees are in that day. And we see this when we go out with our auditors into facilities and we start looking at training records. And now remember the FDA is gonna look at those. And you suddenly see that Jimmy Jones say, for instance, didn't get trained. And you ask the question, why? Oh, Jimmy wasn't in on the day we did the training. Well, did you remember to schedule him to be trained when he came back? If you didn't, he didn't get refresher training and now you've got a little bit of an issue. Enables management team to participate if you do the training in-house. Therefore, you can train many people. So talking about training your management now, not your all the employees. If you bring a trainer in, to train you, you can have two or three or four or five or six, depending on the size of your facility, other supervisors and managers sit in. And the cost is basically the same as if you were training just one person. And you didn't have to leave, nor did they. Because when we're talking about overcoming the cost, and that may be one of your biggest obstacles, is your management is saying, I don't know that we've got the money to do that. Well, the unfortunate thing is that can't be the answer. You have to do it. You have to build it into the cost of business. You have to budget for it every year. And therefore you have to say, well, where can I get some maybe free training? Well, lean on your chemical supplier to give you training free of charge. If you're buying enough chemicals, they'll do that. Lean on some of your suppliers if they are willing to, because you buy a considerable amount of materials from them, they may be willing to come over and do some training for you. So again, look into free training. These webinars could be considered free training, though they're not in depth, but they are at least a little informational, hopefully, based on the number of people who sign up. We feel we are providing information because people keep coming back. There's online learning modules that can be reviewed as needed. So therefore they're there for you to do at any time. A lot of them you can start and stop, start and stop. You can do them in the evening, you can do them on weekends and you don't have to go anywhere. 
And those are things that are offered by us and we're also offered by our competition. So look into that, because that's more cost effective, maybe. But again, the problem with those is there is an upside and a downside. The upside is it's cost, more cost effective. The downside is there is nobody to ask questions of and, no, and you can't hear other people asking questions and answers. And house training delivered by an experienced trainer is obviously an option. And that's what I said a minute ago, you can then train more than one person. You can train four, five, 10, depending on the size of your facility in one training session. Or you can train your own employees. But remember, again, if you're going to train your employees, you need to understand exactly what the message is you're trying to get across and why it's important and why they should do it. This is just basically talking to them without basically giving them any feel for why they have to do things. We've done some virtual training and we're going to do more of that in March. And some of this, again, is you pay for it. And it's a little deeper dive than these one hour webinars that we're doing. And again, it's based on topics that are felt to be ones that people want more information on, want a little bit more help on, want to know how to do something a little bit more than what you can cover in 45 minutes. But then there's the public training classes, which are offered all over the country by us and our competition. And Holly will talk about some of these later. And where you can come and the advantage of those is you don't have to pay for more than one person. And you can hear other people who are there ask questions that you may want to be a little nervous to ask or two, you may not have thought about asking. And you can gain information and additional training from listening to the answers. Take a look at those public training classes. Again, the question is, are they in the city where you are? Are they convenient to the date that you want to be trained? Obviously, this was one of the ones that Holly said in the little poll we did was one of your biggest challenges. I feel for you on this one because this can become a constant everyday thing. And depending on what type of business you're in, there are some companies with turnover is so high that basically they're turning over the, their employees at least once or twice a year, if not more. The fast food industry traditionally has, I believe, about a 400% turnover. Hopefully none of you get anywhere close to that. So let's talk about what your challenges are with this high turnover, because obviously, In, I mean, having to train new people because that employee lasted a couple of days and left. And one of the biggest problems is, again, if you've got some email management people and you've made them your SQF practitioner or if you made them your key BRC person and they leave and you didn't have a backup person, you're in a little bit of trouble because you don't have somebody now to manage that program. So now you got to move quickly. So again, I would recommend that all of you have at least one backup for every position of that type of level. Now, what I've seen some companies doing with their hourly employees now, and it's not widespread, but some companies are doing it. They're using an employment agency who, one, takes a look at the em prospective employee just to make sure that they are what the company wants. They do background checks and they do a lot of other stuff, but they're also giving them the right to do the initial training. And they train their people at the employment agency on how to get across basic GMPs, the reason why health and hygiene is important, et cetera, et cetera. So that these employees, when they come to work the first day, they're ready to go on the line versus you bring them in and you got to spend several hours getting them up to speed. And that takes you away from doing what you're doing while you're doing that. Well, if you're having a high turnover, this becomes a constant job. And that's why I go to some companies, maybe more in the industries like the meat industry, where they have a lot of employees standing shoulder to shoulder on lines and their turnover is extremely high. So they quite often have an HR person who just does training almost on a daily basis. 
bringing people in, getting them up to speed, turning them around on the line, and then two days later they're gone and you have to start all over again. If that's your uh, challenge, then obviously you're into doing constant training, constant training, constant training. I feel for you because that seems like it's very unrewarding to spend all that time to have an employee last just a couple of days. Some of them have gone to video. And there are some training videos out there where you can actually put a employee in front of a monitor and have them watch a video. But one of the challenges there, you gotta make sure they're watching it. You gotta make sure they're listening to it. You have to make sure that they're benefiting from it. And if all they're gonna do is just sit there for 15 minutes, watch the video, and then you're gonna put them out on the line and they really didn't pay attention. So you have to decide how you're going to monitor the engagement. You're gonna give them a little test at the end. You're gonna ask them some questions. If not, the videos would not work for you if the employee is not gonna be serious and watch them. Remember, health and hygiene are the minimum you've got to do. So if you're not going to do any more with the people you just hired who have the more junior jobs, then make sure you've got proof to show the FDA that at least you trained them in health and hygiene. And therefore, when the FDA comes out and asks some questions and says, what type of training did you have before you attend out into the plans? You don't want the answer, I haven't had any yet. But you've got to balance now production quarters and employee time because you're in the business of making product. You're in the business of getting product out the door. You're in the business of making a profit. And any time that you take time away from the line and you bring employees in, then you unfortunately are not making any product. Yet you've got to do this and you've got to do the training annually for the FDA and the USDA and for CFI. And so therefore, you have to say to yourself, when should I do this training? Well, it will be minimum disruption of production. Well, if you're gonna have a normal shutdown where you shut down the plant for maintenance and major cleanup and that, and you shut down for a week, then that could be a very good time to do it. But remember, if you're gonna bring an employee in for a couple of hours, the question is how much do you have to pay them do you have to pay them for a whole day? In that case, you want to have a lot of training and you want to make it into small uh, sessions because, again, you don't want to sit an hourly employee down for eight hours and say, well, we've got to pay for you to come in a whole day, so we're going to give you eight hours worth of training because after a few hours, you're basically talking to yourself. You're not talking to them. But that would be a good time to do it. So is that a possibility for you that you could do it in non-production time? If you're going to do it during production time, which shift? Well, if you're only running one shift, that answers itself. We only run one shift. I only do day shift. But if you're doing a first and a second shift, when do you want to do it? At the start or the close of the shift? Well, the start of the shift, if it's early morning, you may not have the employees who are as awake as they need to be. Hopefully, they're awake enough to go out on the production line and run production and not injure themselves. But is that the best time? If you do it at the end of the shift, then they, their mind is on where they're going next, which is home, and whatever they're going to do that evening, or whether they're going to go shopping on the way home, or then that may not be the best time either. If you finish up, that you can't keep their attention because they're thinking about, I want to get out of here, I want to get home. But when you're doing two shifts, that may be the time to do it, where you start off at the end of one shift, training those employees, and then you would start the second shift and you train them. Well, if you can overlap them and bring them both in, maybe you can get two shifts where the people trained at the same time. Again, that all depends on how many employees you've got, the size of your training room, et cetera, et cetera. But these are the challenges and these are the things you have to think about. And again, when you're training new employees, it's different than when you're doing refresher training. And you say to yourself, well, how often do I have to do refresher training for employees that work for me for 20 years and I keep telling them the same things over and over again to where they're basically talking to me as if I'm preaching to the choir. I've had this, I do this, I never have a problem doing what you tell me to do, but yet every year you keep coming back and telling me exactly the same thing. 
Well, unfortunately, the FDA requires that. Now, they're thinking about maybe reducing that. And so hopefully in the next few years, the FDA is going to say, if you believe that an employee has been with you long enough that they know what they're doing, then maybe the refresher training isn't necessary. And if it is necessary, what are you doing to, that's different than what you did a year ago, two years ago, three years ago? I would say right now with the GMPs changing for FDA regulated products, I would certainly be doing the professional training now to make them sure they understand the difference between a food safety plan and a hassle plan, the difference between a FDA inspector coming in versus now an FDA investigator coming in who can come in and question them. So I think the climate is changing. And if I was in Canada, I'd be talking about safe food for Canadians that went into effect this year. And so there would be something that would make refresher training maybe more valuable this year than just going over the same things you've gone over every year for the last 10 years. Because your know, employees have to know what the rules are. They have to know what the regulations are. They have to know what your customer expects. They have to know what you expect. Because basically when you're running a plant, The one we see by USDA, FDA, but you also want to be making sure you're meeting the GFSI requirements, and you also want to make sure that you're meeting your customers' requirements. Well, you know, working with customers, some of them are a little bit more demanding and others. Some have certain things that are more key to them. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to make sure I've got records I've done that. And therefore, as we said, first of all, does require the use of qualified individuals. So who's your qualified individual on your staff? And if you're using an outside consultant or a corporate person, remember, you still have the responsibility inside your facility to be able to answer questions on that food safety plan that food defense plan or the foreign supplier verification program if it applies to you. So make sure that you have had a qualified individual put those together for you. You got records of the qualifications of that individual and that you can answer questions on it. Now, people always come back and say, well, you've been talking about we have to do this refresher training for hourly employees. Is there a requirement anywhere that you do it for management employees? And the answer is no. Currently, there is no requirements in GFSI or in FDA, CFIA, USDA that you retrain your management personnel after they've already been trained and they've been shown to be competent. Now, that word competent, I want to stress that word. The FDA is very concerned that the employees who are in some management supervisory positions in certain plants are not as competent as they need to be. And you can read this in some of the information that the FDA has put out. So when they come to your plant, they're not just going to be questioning the hourly employees. They're going to be questioning the supervisory employees because when things go wrong, it is generally not the hourly employee who comes up with a solution to fix the problem and do the root cause analysis and do the corrective actions. That's usually supervisory management people. Well, if they're not competent, then they actually sometimes make matters worse. And if you look at the justification for FISMA and for food safety plans, the FDA talks about that in that booklet that they put out several years ago now, that's about 903 pages long, and the actual food safety plan information or the preventive control of human food is only about 100 pages. But if you read the other 800 pages, it talks in there about the FDA's concern that management people aren't as competent as they need to be. They talk about the head of your sanitation group maybe not being as competent. And yet that's the person running the sanitation group. So if the 
supervisor is incompetent, how would the supervisor be able to judge that his sanitation crew are doing what they're supposed to be doing? And we've seen many incidences of lack of good sanitation resulting in allergen cross-contact, environmental pathogens in your packaging room, et cetera. So again, you've got to make sure your employees have it. So ensure your alley employees complete annual training and make sure you got records for that. And in the past, you would have said, well, what was the big problem with records? As long as the GFSI auditor didn't look at them, or if he did, he gave us a pass. Remember now the regulator's going to be looking at them. And I don't think the regulator's into giving you a pass. Organize your food safety expert to attend training on PCQI. I said, and I will repeat it, the FDA does not require you to go to that training, but I would strongly recommend that somebody from your company goes there. And preferably somebody who works at your site, not a corporate person, that they go. If applicable, organize training for FSBP, Final Supply Verification Program. Now, that only applies if you are actually the FSBP importer, which means you're importing something in from outside the United States, and you are responsible for the food safety of that imported ingredient, product, or packaging material. And I will remind you, it also includes packaging equipment, and it involves cutting boards and a whole lot of stuff that they put off for a couple of years. But that's much more detailed the requirements of foreign suppliers and it is of domestic suppliers because FSMA does not require packaging plants inside the US to meet FSMA, but it does require packaging plants outside. Well, if you're going to be the FSBP importer, you better make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then don't worry about it. Ensure your drivers, if they are handling produce and they're delivering it, and this quite often would be more the route trucks where the driver is going to be putting his hands in the box. You say, well, we're in the produce business, but we send it out on pallets. It's all shrink wrapped and the driver doesn't get anywhere close to it. They're not talking about that driver. They're talking about the driver who's going to lift a box off and deliver it at a restaurant, deliver it at a uh, hotel, et cetera. And he's going to put their fingers in that box. And therefore, the possibility is whatever's on their fingers is going to come in contact with the produce, which is ready to eat. In that case, you have to have them trained and you have to give them the ability to wash their hands and they have to understand why they're going to wash their hands. They also have to understand as they're hauling temperature sensitive products, then why they have to keep the product cold. Organize training for your entire team on food defense. I think this one's sneaking up on most people because the lack of interest that I found in people in food defense, I think is a couple of things. I think one, they think it's whatever look, we've got scribbled on a piece of paper, like keeping doors locked and, and uh, trailers sealed is all I need to have. And they don't understand how detailed that plan has to be when you're gonna show it to the FDA. I don't have time to go into that in detail, but don't let it sneak up on you. Remember, it goes into effect in the middle of this year for large companies, another year for medium companies, and another year for small companies. Don't get caught with a food defense that doesn't meet the new FDA more stringent standards. The FDA is going to be interested in how you're catching your own problems, just the same as the GFSI auditor is. So how many people in your place have had internal auditor training? And you're only required to have one who's been trained in some type of formal training, whether you did it online or whether you went to a class, then you can go ahead and train the rest of your team. And again, a stress team, because you shouldn't be doing internal audits as an individual. What's this all leading to? It's all leading to the fact that you will be able to put out safe products with trained employees, and be able to show records to the FDA and the GFSI auditor that you're doing this training. And you have to get past these obstacles that we've been talking about by deciding how you're going to do this training. 
Because if not, then how are you going to demonstrate continuous improvement? And one of the ways you do that is by doing those thorough and meaningful internal audits. And we've talked about that in previous webinars, and I'm sure we'll talk about that again maybe later this year. Because if you're not doing good internal audits and finding your own problems, I'm sure you don't want the regulator to find your problems. I'm sure you don't want the GFSI auditor to find your problems. And I know you don't want it to result because you didn't find a problem in somebody getting sick or you're having a major recall. And we've talked about the expense of that. We've now got the FDA saying that when you discover deficiencies, that you've got to do a root cause analysis. So therefore, there's somebody being trained in root cause analysis. It is not something that everybody is familiar with. It's not something that everybody can do. But yet you've got to lay down what system did you use? Did you use the five wires? Did you use the fishbone? And what did you come up with as a root? And the regulator's going to be looking for that. And people say, well, I'll be writing a whole lot of stuff. No, you'll only be writing a whole lot of stuff if you have a whole lot of issues. And if you have a whole lot of issues, then it's in your best interest to get rid of all those issues. Then you won't be writing much at all because you will have good root cause analysis and good corrective actions and the problems should go away. If they didn't go away, you obviously didn't come up with the right root cause or you didn't put in the right corrective action. It's best that you learn from your own problems, but then you can learn from other people's problems. So the webinars. If you're not going to the FDA, CFIA, USDA websites on a regular basis and looking to see who's having recalls, who's being cited, who's having problems, who's getting warning letters, then you're not giving yourself the advantage of learning what did they do wrong. Not that you're going to say, hey, that's them, that's not me, but that's that because I'm going to learn from where they stumbled. And so I go to there, I have FDA and I have even CFIA and USDA, and I get all those recalls come to my phone every day. Now, most of them, I just glance at them and move on. But then I'm starting to see some things again that are coming up that we thought we were past, like allergen recalls all the time and salmonella on spinach and et cetera. And you go, gee, I'm not sure that we're getting where we need to be if we're continuing to sometimes have the same issues over and over again. But I think the numbers are starting to decrease. They certainly are on listeria in environmental monitoring. Remain, you want to get that high GFSI score. Because why? Well, it looks good to your customer. It looks good if you can go on announce versus announce. It's good if you get the A plus or the A asterisk, or you get the excellent. Well, you're not going to get that if you don't have good trained employees and you know, and you know yourself what to do. These are all things again that you're able to go to maybe senior management and say, look how well we're doing because we're training our employees. Versus, yes, I know it costs money to do the training and therefore it is a cost. But if that management is looking at it as a cost and not a benefit, then somehow that attitude has to change. Because obviously the other thing you want to do, and when we're talking food safety, remember food safety isn't the only thing. Yes, a couple of those GFSI audits, food quality is an option. In two of them, it's not. In two of them, it is. But for your customer, quality is as important as food safety. So make sure you're training your employees in how to assess quality, how to put out a good quality product. So you don't get customer complaints, whether it's because a product ran out of shelf life and went stale, or whether it was broken, or whether it was the wrong color, that's as important to the customer as food safety. The only good news for you is they're not going to go get a lawyer if the quality of the products are not there, but if you make them sick, the chances are they will. The bottom line is with well-trained employees and overcoming these challenges, 
hopefully you get more product that gets out the door and doesn't have to be reworked, doesn't have to be discarded, and you don't send it coming back on a truck because the chef or the store or your customer is returning it to you because there's an issue with it as they receive it. We talked about recalls. It appears in days like they're not going down. But when you look at what's causing recalls, you see three things. It's allergens, listeria monocytogenous, and salmonella. Now, if that's not your facility, that's not your products, then don't worry about it. But I'm sure one of those three is something that should be a concern to you. You wanna be sure that when the FDA or CFIA comes in, you're not worried that they're gonna find something. You're not worried that your employees are not going to be able to answer the questions and give the right answers because they know they're the right answers and they know what to say. But practice with your supervisors. Can they answer the question, what would you do if things went wrong? What would constitute a recall? What would we do if we had a crisis? And if they can't answer those questions, then you need to do better supervisory training. So Holly, how about covering things and then we'll get into that's great. Thanks, Dr. Bob. If you want to click forward there, we've got a, quite a few questions um, that I'll speak to in just a moment. I just thought I'd spend a moment to highlight our training offerings. We'll send a few links post webinar so you can read at your leisure, but I just thought I'd summarize. Um, we have a number of different public training courses through a training and improvement solutions um, business unit and the, the public training courses are listed on your screen. There's lots more. We can also deliver these on site. So we'll sort of off the shelf um, and you can reach us um, via the website listed on your screen there if you want to learn more. Um, we also have a number of different on the next slide online learning solutions. So these can be um, you know, taken on at your own pace and um, are accessible in a virtual environment as well. So um, lots of different options to help support your organization through your food safety training journey. Um, all right, thank you so much, Dr. Bob, for your presentation. Lots of great comments um, along the way. A couple of questions. So can you give some examples of what um, training work records should look like? So what's the ideal um, solution to demonstrating records? Well, one, they have to have the employee. First of all, the top of the record has the name, have the name of your company and the street address. So there's no doubt this is a training record for your facility. And that's part of what FDA is stressing. Secondly, it should have all the employees' names, and it's one of the few documents where you're actually going to use their full name up. Then it's going to have to ha have their job title. So clearly, then it would go along with some type of job description if the GFSI or the regulator was going to check what type of training that person should have had. Then it should have columns, which at the top of each of the columns would be what you're training them in, GMP, allergen, <laughs> environmental monitoring, HACCP, whatever. And that doesn't mean every employee has to be trained in there, but you may have 10 columns at the top. Below each of those columns, if their employee is supposed to be trained in that, would be an actual date. And it would be a date in 2018, being replaced now with dates in 2019. So at any time, you could look at that record and see who's been trained, what were they trained in, when were they trained, and who is ready, who is supposed to be having refresher training. And that's something you then put in front of a regulator, and basically the regulator knows that you've done what you're supposed to do. Okay, great, thank you. Can you comment on which course is the most difficult to train in-house? Oh, I see what they're saying. So by their own staff, they have experts in their own business. Which topic would you not advise um, relying on the organization to teach, so peer-to-peer, -peer, and which, so in other words, which one should they outsource? Well, I think one of the challenges if you're doing environmental monitoring, are you skilled enough to do environmental monitoring training of your own employees? Or would it be better to have one of the companies that sell the environmental swabs come over and do the training for you? And some of them will do that free of charge because obviously they're selling your product and they want you to buy their product. And so I would lean on them to do that training unless you really feel skilled in doing that. 
And the same on chemicals. If you're, if you're really conversant about your chemicals and you understand what they do and how they do it and what strength they're supposed to be and all that, you may say to yourself, I can do that training myself and maybe the head of your sanitation group can do that. But why not bring in the experts if they'll come for free? Now, they won't do that if you're not buying a whole lot of chemicals, but it still may be worth you paying them to come in and your chemical company, if they won't give you for free, will generally come if you're willing to pay them. And they're the experts, that's their chemicals. After that, I would say the basic stuff you should be able to do yourself. Now, the question is, on um, if you say, well, how about internal auditor training? Well, if you feel, well, after you've gone to the class, you can go back and do it. I think you have to judge it on what you think the skill set of your fellow supervisors is and how easy you think you can train them yourself. When you get outside your comfort zone, then I think you need to bring somebody else in. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of questions does an inspector ask to verify an employee's understanding of personal hygiene? They'll ask them, think, they could ask them questions like, why is it important for you to wash your hands? And uh, what do you think would happen if you didn't wash your hands? And therefore, what would be the consequence to that food you just touched? And I would obviously be talking about somebody who's actually touching the food. It's most companies do, but the GMP regulations don't require gloves. They require a clean hand. So that's what the type of thing I'd ask them. And I would also ask them, you know, why, why do you think it's a problem if you're sick at work? Because we, health and hygiene go together. And see if they understand that anything that's coming out of their body can finish somebody else's body. Do they understand that somebody's going to eat that food? Okay. Do you have any comment on uh, the human aspect of training? So how to motivate folks to learn and engage with the training? Well, that's a really good question because obviously, you know, some people, you can sit them in a the classroom and you can and train them and you can teach them and they absorb it and they understand it. Uh, but remember, that's not everybody. So they, you're going to get to a point where you're going to have some employees, which even if you keep it to 15 minutes or 20 minutes and you don't get into too much depth, it's still not going to get across. In that case, you have to go to show me, I'll show you, you show me. And you have to go out and do it on the line. And you have to show them what you're talking about. And then have them then show you and then you show them. And you may have to do that multiple times. That becomes a point where you go, I don't think you're ever going to get it. So let's see if we can find another job in the plant that we can give you versus you showing them the door. But again, you're going to have to judge that yourself. Some people are really good learners and some people are not. Okay. Okay. If you make pet food and the pet food that it is considered, um, it's considered human grade, does the human food PCQI training satisfy that training requirement, or do you need to have separate training for both pet and human food? That's a very interesting question because one, first of all, pet food has to be considered human food because people eat it and they have to meet the same requirements as human food. What I didn't agree with the FDA, but the FDA decided this, is actually for pet food, you have to go to the preventive controls for animal food. And so you can't go to the PCQI for human food and then be qualified to do pet food. So I'm sorry, you'll have to go to the animal food one, of which one of the training modules in there is pet food and another training module in there is animal feed. And for the FDA, for in their wisdom, approved a class to put you on that side, even though your pet food has to meet the human standard. Would you benefit from going to both? Yes, but that's going to be two, three day classes. Okay, thanks for that, Dr. Bob. Um, if there's a, this participant is a student and he's wondering if it's um, his responsibility to train himself for any food safety program or is it the company's responsibility who will hire into their food uh, production facility? Who owns that responsibility? The senior management of the site is responsible for giving that training to people and not have them self-train themselves. So the answer to that is senior management, not the PCQI person, not the QA person, 
They will not be held accountable if training is not done in the facility. The most senior person in that facility will be held responsible. Okay, great. Okay, Sorry, I'm just combing through the last bit of questions here. All right, last question here. Um, when you look at the knowledge gap uh, between younger employees and older employees, how would you, um, and obviously this person speaking to evolution of training over the years, how would you achieve sort of a consistent balance to the training program? So understanding that it's evolved from the uh, previous years to now, how do you sort of get it to an estate that's sort of current and obviously has to be constantly updated based on regulatory environment, but how do you sort of address the knowledge gap of the folks that may have um, in-depth knowledge from years ago, but uh, maybe are not as uncurrent with the uh, current um, topics? Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's again another interesting question because it sometimes age brings with you a lot more experience and a lot more knowledge just that you've gained over the years. It also brings with it sometimes a stubbornness and I already done, I've always done it this way, so why would I have to do it differently? And we know a lot more today than we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And so you gain, you're right. You have to get past the attitude is I can't learn anymore. I'm still learning. I've been doing this for 40 odd years and I still don't know it all. And I'll never know it all. And the day I think I know it all, that's the day that uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fooling myself. And so therefore one of your challenges is going to be trying to blend in that older mindset. I've been here for years, I've done it, and I'm just not going to listen to what you're telling me about all these new things or the new things I have to do. That employee has to, somehow you got to get across to them and they're going to do it. The young active mind, again, it may be a little different. Some of them may be like sponges. They soak it up, they get into it, they, they buy into it, and you're off and running. But then you're always faced with the challenges. I'm not here for more than just to pick up a paycheck. And so at five o'clock, I'm out of here and I don't want to be worrying about anything. So I'm just going to do enough to keep my job. And so I, it is one of your challenges is how you deal with not only the young versus the older person, but how do you deal with somebody who doesn't feel like I need to know all this stuff? They're working in a food plant. If they don't know, understand that people are going to eat the food and that people can get sick and die, then you need to be giving them examples of where companies have gone wrong and finished up getting people sick and killing them. And if that's not enough to scare them into the fact that you don't want to have your company or them involved in it, then I don't know what else would work. Yeah, indeed. All right, last question for today, Dr. Bob. If all of the ingredients in a finished goods are approved for human consumption, but you're making an item that is marketed to dogs, how should the facility be registered? Well, the FDA requires you to be registered because you're making pet food, and so pet food is considered to be human food because somebody's going to go ahead and eat it. And so I would get on the FDA website for registration and look up and see if the pet food category is there and make sure that you're registered. And if not, then make sure that you don't have to register. But I believe you do. But again, I'm getting a little into I'm not sure. So I have to be honest and say I'm not sure. But I do know that your food has to be able to be eaten by humans, even though the flavor may not be good, the odor may not be good, the mouthfeel may not be good, it's still got to be safe because some little kid may accidentally start eating it. Yep, great. Yeah. great. Excellent. With that, I think we'll close off the webinar for today. We'll send a link to the recording and the slide deck to everyone who's registered. Dr. Bob, thank you so much for your presentation and thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you, everybody, and tune in to our next webinars. Bye.